you are not going to get replaced by an AI. You are going to get replaced by a human who knows how to use AI. Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Today, we're here with Aoife Roche, who is involved in a number of artificial intelligence ventures. She's the founder of SuperDupe. She's one of the VPs over at Ask ROI. She does many, many more things than that. But we're going to be talking about mainly the artificial intelligence thing she does today. And I always love bringing on a Las Vegas local who's involved in the tech community and getting to know all the talented people behind our tech companies here in Vegas. Thanks for joining us here today, Aoife. Thank you, Jason. I'm excited to be on. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to you all for watching. Go ahead, like, comment, and share right now so we can reach as many people as possible. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our interviews with remarkable leaders like Aoife. So what inspired you to leave Ireland and carve out a career in the Las Vegas tech scene? What were some of the stops along your journey? <laughs> it's a pretty loaded question, but yeah, I, I, so I always wanted to come to America. I was actually supposed to come in 2011. At that time I was working in corporate. I was supposed to come to New York, um, but that ended up not happening. So I compromised and stayed in London for about eight years until 2019. I came back to the U S again. I was at that time I was doing a lot in the fitness space. And I realized, you know what, I should have done, made the move in 2011, but I'm going to make the move now. So the ambition to get to America was always there for me, right? Because you imagine Ireland, right? We have 6 million people. It's smaller than Florida. So the opportunities in, uh, in Ireland, although it's a great country, they are capped simply by the population size. So I knew that, you know, not to use a pun, but like America was where the opportunities were, right? Is the, the land of freedom and opportunity. So I wanted to be, take a part of that. So I came back in 2019 and I made the decision that I was actually going to come back and I went home for what should have been um, a three or four month stint. But we all know what happened in 2020, then COVID happened. So my trip to Ireland actually ended up lasting for two years as opposed to a couple of months because of the pandemic. So that was one of the biggest challenges I think I saw at that time was being able to hold the vision of what I wanted to create and know that, because you remember back at that time, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know when things were going to open up again. So, and what, but that what allowed me to do was really, really delve into the tech space, right? Because in the middle of the pandemic, everyone needed to be online. Every business had to go digital, had to go virtual. So it sort of catapulted me into that environment and into the tech space, um, which led to me creating the company in Ireland. Then we moved the company to the UK. And then finally in 2021, at the end of 2021, we moved the company to the US and started in the US at the beginning of 2022. Well, we're glad you're here in the U.S. and we're glad you chose Las Vegas uh, for your companies. So going back, you were not involved in tech like you are now before you started these companies. What were the opportunities you saw in tech back in 2019, 2020 that led you down this path? What were the big opportunities you saw then and what are the big opportunities you see now? So when my background, I started my, my first job back in 2005, giving away how old I am, but back in 2005 was actually as a software engineer. So I was always involved in software development and processes. And I spent 10 years in Barclays, HSBC, Dell, Capgemini, a lot of the big um, sort of consulting based companies. But what I was brought into companies more so to do was identify their tech gaps their people gaps and how to integrate multiple different systems or consolidate. And what I realized back in um, when the pandemic happened and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do because I said we retired in 2018, I realized that marketing was just all about data, right? It was all about being able to move data from A to B and making that data meaningful. 
So that was where I really saw the opportunity because I saw a lot of marketing agencies, but they were running ads and creatives, but people didn't really understand the data. So then that, that drove me down the path of creating the actual, the agency, which was a very much a data-driven agency, focusing on LinkedIn, especially, as well as um, doing media buying. And then when ChatGPT came out, everyone was getting so excited. And I thought, oh, God, this was so easy for me to pick up again that I realized, you know what, we, we let's go down this path because I do believe, and you asked me where the market is going, um, or what I see happening, marketing agencies as they exist today in the next three years are going to cease to exist, right? Because of the operation of us building AI assistants, autonomous agents, being able to use them for copy, for creative, for styles, for video rendering. So uh, any marketing agency owner I see right now is really at risk, right? Because you are going to become obsolete because AI is gonna do it better. And when it came to creating the companies, a lot of what, how I created and how I got involved in these companies was be me solving problems. So one of my super dupe company, that challenge was I didn't want to be in front of the camera. I knew I had to be in front of the camera because I run a social media marketing agency and I talk about it, but I didn't want to be, be in front of the camera. So I was like, how can I not do this? And it was the same with any of the other ones. Every kind of business that I've created from a tech space has been driven by me problem solving about how I could either make things better, faster, more efficiently, or to free up my time. Um, so that's so now we're, we're involved in generative AI in the Ask ROI space. We're building out assistance and autonomous agents and assistants to be able to execute on tasks. We have the super dupe which creates the digital doubles of you so that you don't have to show up on camera. And then we have the agency, which is very much driven on data analytics and looking at um, very specifically how our content is performing by leveraging data. So at every layer and aspect, there's a little bit of AI involved in the process. Yeah, you'll get to see who the winners and losers are in the marketing agency space. The ones who I think are going to be the winners are the ones who have already pivoted and are starting to incorporate AI into their digital platforms and offload a lot of the work they would do in-house at the agency back to the customer using AI. There's there's already a number of companies and platforms that are doing that, and they're they're just starting out, but I think they're going to end up being the winners. So what was the moment you knew Las Vegas was the right place for your tech ventures? Yeah, so I started out in LA because LA was all I knew. Right, because I've been in I, I, LA was where I was in the fitness space in 2019. But after spending two years in LA, I realized it's very much focused on the entertainment industry, um, and you know there there is good networking here. But I was starting to look at the Las Vegas landscape, looking at all of the conference, looking at all of the tech um, that I was seeing coming up, and how much more accessible that audience was in LA. I had the entertainment audience. That was very easy, actors, fitness, all of them. But that wasn't the market I was going after. So I came to Vegas for a couple of events and then I was speaking to the team at Ask ROI and they said, well, you know, why don't you just come here and take over our sales division for Ask ROI? Because, you know, I speak it so people say AI is IFA intelligence. I just speak about AI so effortlessly and easy. So I said, you know what, the weather is better, the standard of living is better, the traffic is better, and there's more people. So I just made the plunge in May and I said, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And I love it. I really do love it. So, yeah, we all love Vegas here. I think you've put out the big highlights over a big city like L.A. or New York or even some of the Silicon Valley Uh it's just much easier to live here and you can still get everything done you need to get done. It's it's amazing here. So. Are, we're not exactly known for our tech scene, though, here in Vegas, and you're getting to know it. What has surprised you about the tech community, the startup community here in Las Vegas? Well, what I love is about how many entrepreneurs are actually here, right? Every time we're either running events or going out to events, there are a lot of younger entrepreneurs here, right? Like, and, and they're all doing something a little bit different, like from people who are doing travel apps to people who are doing billboards to people who are doing content creation avatar creation generative ai solutions um and how accessible it is right you're just going to these events and you're walking in and bumping in and it's like well i have a platform that does this and i have a platform that does that and i think that is very rich 
Um, Las Vegas is very rich in the ability to create connections and build a network with a team of like-minded individuals. Because, you know, and you know as well as I do, sometimes this entrepreneurial journey can be lonely, right? When, Especially when you're when you're trying to create things that don't exist and you're trying to get people to see your vision. Um, but I definitely find the startup community here is very open and receptive. And it's also a highly capitalized city, right? There is money in Las Vegas. And I say to people, well, if you're going to start a business anywhere, you might as well go and start it where the money is, right? Rather than starting it where the money is not. And I think Vegas is really showing me that there is an awful lot of capital available or an interest in people to get involved in these different ventures with different VC groups, as well as just all of the networking that goes on at all of the conferences. There is for sure money flowing through Las Vegas as well as in Las Vegas. And speaking of having a vision, so many people who have a vision here, private LLMs are creating a really big stir in the AI community and you're doing that with them. What was the opportunity you saw that others might have missed when it came to that? Yeah, so it's it's about the data, right, and understanding where the data is actually going. So the biggest challenge when ChatGPT came out, everyone like got very excited and started loading up a whole bunch of data. Like I had one person call me once. He said, "I just took my whole CRM, loaded it up into ChatGPT, and it, and I was like, okay, all your confidential customer information, including names, addresses, and phone numbers." I was like, "It's probably not a very good idea," right? So I think that. People are now starting to become aware of the idea, one, where your data is going, and two, how do you actually leverage the data? So what we've done on the Ask OI platform, we've built out, if you imagine ChatGPT and Google and Zapier had a baby, right? Just imagine mm-hmm. that. That's sort, of, that's sort of where we're at. We're in that middle kind of space where you have... You have the knowledge bases that uh, you can upload all of your data and it stores it like a Google Drive. You have the custom assistants, which are pre-built assistants similar to what you would have with um, ChatGPT agents or assistants. And then you also have files and folder structure that can we can create workspaces and train the team. So what that means is an organization can come in and upload all of their confidential and private data, knowing that it's in a single repository, but then it can use these pre-trained assistants to interrogate that data and to get them the responses that they want. Um, And that's one that we're working on right now at the moment. One of the biggest use cases that we have is the government contracting. So, because I've started doing government contracting and I realized there's such a massive overhead in actually responding to these RFPs. And what we found is now that we're able to load all of the data up into a single location and train all of these assistants, when I'm writing my RFP, my AI just goes out and looks all of my data that's loaded. And you just don't have that with the the other real generative AIs. And you don't have the security of knowing that your data is protected, right? Absolutely. You're making an incredible case for why companies should choose your solution and pay you rather than just kind of struggle along with the free platforms that are out there, the free AI platforms that we can all get access to, especially because you're going to upload your data and they're going to use it to help other folks. So what's the next big move for Ask ROI in revolutionizing how we all do business? Yeah, so like I said, the, the biggest one that I have, that we're, so we have a conference in November, on, um, uh, which is called the Risk on 360 conference. So I'm going to be doing an Apple-style launch at that conference of our government product. Um, we've partnered with FGA, which is Federal Government Advisors. They're one of the biggest government um, companies here where they help business owners with solicitations. I've realized that every single business owner should be pitching to the government for their services, right? There is billions and billions of dollars on the table for different, from marketing to construction, to roofing, to leadership, to development. And a lot of these go to a small majority of businesses because they're the ones who've been able to fine tune the RFP process and could do multiple submissions with multiple teams. My vision is the idea that we are going to create an AI solution that any business owner out there will be able to leverage our solution to actually help them to write their RFPs and their solicitations and create their proposals to be able to submit. So you no longer have to hire a bid writer 
for 200,000 every year that we're going to build these custom assistance that is going to be able to help you to actually um, leverage the proposals. Because I think every small business owner out there, veteran owns, female business owners, hub zone business owners should be pitching into the US government. But the challenge comes in the overhead from the business perspective about getting all of that documentation, um, which is kind of really where we're excited about it. We're just in the process right now. We've built individual assistants who do execute all of the tasks. The next phase in our project is where we're going to make them autonomous. So we will have one, you will trigger an event, which will trigger another event, which will trigger another event, which will trigger another event and do the whole process for you. And then a Slack message will get sent to say, hey, I just wrote you your proposal for this RFP that you were going for based on all of the data you preloaded into the system. Here's it for your review, which would mean that people could be submitting a bid a week. You could be sub submit No, you, even if you submitted 52 bids a year, you're never going to be able to take on that volume of work from the US government. But that would be a good problem to have. For sure. And I think there's uh, some folks watching this in the nonprofit world who are clamoring to get a hold of you to see if you can help them with grant writing as well, because it sounds like that would that would fit right in. You talked a little bit about your other venture, SuperDupe. How does that fit into the big picture of helping us all do business better as we hit the middle of this decade? Yeah, so, and I literally just had a, a meeting there with one of the, the biggest training and soft skills companies in the US where we're looking at the idea of um, leveraging the SuperDo platform to help them. So every single business owner out there has some level of expertise, right, with regard to their particular industry or niche. A lot of people never dive into leveraging or creating digital products simply because of the overhead in creating a digital product, recording it, scripting it, editing it, trying to perfect it, right? It is a lot of work where what we're looking at is one um, course creation. So being able to take my visual, let's say like I'm here right now, take that visual, clone my voice, and then be able to help me to create the course modules. Um, which will be a huge benefit for business owners, not only for course videos, but for training videos, for explainer videos, um, like any information frequently asked questions on your website can all be done on video. Uh, the other one that we do a lot of right now is we do reels. And I know Instagram and TikTok and them, you have to mark your content as AI generated content, which is fine because we're in an attention economy and you know who gets attention the person who takes up the most amount of landscape on a screen who is showing up most, most amount of the time so what our platform is enabling us to do is we for our clients are able to create massive amounts of videos at scale for them we fully edit them and then they post them on their platform so their activity and their social media presence is constantly being amplified with these perfectly crafted curated scripts so that they can grab the attention of their audience. Um, and that really, the, the reason I created that platform, because these were the objections I got. I don't have the time, um, I don't know what to say, and I don't feel I look good on camera. So I built the whole entire business model around those three things. I was like, okay, so what if I, we got your hair and makeup done, I'm gonna assume it's a woman, right? We got your hair and makeup done, you're, you're going to look good on camera. I'm going to, our engine is going to script what you say so you don't ever have to say it. And it's not going to take you any time other than the two minute video it takes you to actually load up on the platform. If I solved all of those problems for you, what would be your excuse? And they were like, there would be no excuse. I would be creating massive content at scale. And that's really, really where we're at. Like, I, you know, I won't pull out the profiles, but we literally have profiles that are being entirely run by AIs right now at the moment. And nobody even knows because the visual is so good. It is so good. Um, and it just helps them to be present because these are busy business owners, right? And unless you're crafting out a couple of hours to sit down and script your content, write your content, film your content, make sure your lighting is good. Most people don't do it and they end up being the best kept secret because they're not active on social media. So no one really knows about them. Yeah, and I've seen some of the super dupe content and it looks amazing. It is indistinguishable from the real thing. At least, you know, me as an amateur, I can't tell the difference. Technology is just moving. It's moving at lightning speed. And 
So what's the one change you're most excited for coming up with businesses adopting AI? And what should we all be watching for coming up? So and we have to do a lot of work in organizations for this, right? And there's a lot of customer education. I spend a lot of time um, with employees to help them to understand. I am not trying to take your job, right? I am trying to make your job more efficient so that you can focus on the things you actually enjoy doing a little bit more. Um, so I think like every business owner, out there has the opportunity to create efficiencies. Like I'll give you an example, just there a few minutes ago, I wanted to do a VSL. So I was able to go into the Ask OI platform. I, I gave it the context of what I wanted the VSL about it. I assigned a persona to it. It wrote me that VSL in a couple of like, let's say 60 seconds. I then read the VSL. I was happy with the copy. I just sent that over to my team. And I said, go and put that onto the SuperDue platform and create me a video so that I'll have my VSL by the time we finish recording here, my VSL will be delivered back into me. That process, if you were to do that normally, could take days, it could take weeks. So every business owner, our business is going to have an opportunity to create efficiencies in their business at every layer and level, should they choose to actually see it. And when business owners are looking at what efficiencies they can do they need to look at two things one is what's time sensitive and what's revenue generating revenue generating is not me doing a vsl revenue generating is the vsl being on an ad on social media where people are actually seeing it so if i can cut the time it takes me to create the vsl do multiple versions of the vsl use multiple different avatar versions of the vsl my opportunity for success is greatly amplified just by the sheer amount of content I'm creating. So within every business, and every business needs to do their own deep dive on their AI strategy and implementation, where are the areas that you can optimize? Where can we create efficiencies? And then knowing, then going out and engaging with like AI consultants and strategists to be like, okay, what is the best way for us to do it, which is what I do a lot with Ask or Why with the enterprise clients. I'll go out and I'll look at their business and I'll just like scan through all of their processes. Um, but the irony is when you actually go and look at a lot of it, a lot of these companies don't even have processes. They, they say, there's SOPs. They're like, a what? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> right. We need to, let's use an AI to build the SOP so that we actually know what's happening. So there's been... There's a lot of human capital that gets lost when people leave the organizations because people are not documenting things because it's too much of an overhead. Whereas we could have an AI, we can do voice into an AI where you just totally AI everything that you do on a daily basis, little craft an SOP, so that if you lose someone or a key resource, you can just onboard another resource without actually ever, you know, having any direct impact on the business. So that's what I see that where the opportunity is for every business owner is understanding what is taking the most amount of time and what drives the most amount of revenue and how can we optimize everything else? Yeah, I love it. One of the things that's most exciting to me about AI, about robotics, about all the things that are coming along here in Las Vegas and in the rest of the tech world is that it allows us to free up humans to do things that humans are much better at. But that also comes with a conversation about ethics. You mentioned how it's going to impact the workforce. What's the critical piece that everyone needs to understand if we want to build a future where humans and AI and robots work together harmoniously? Yeah, and I don't want to be harsh, but, you know, I have to be direct in my communication to tell people what's happening. You are not going to get replaced by an AI. You are going to get replaced by a human who knows how to use AI. Right. That's the difference. So then you get to decide which side of the fence you want to be on. Do you want to be the person who is objecting to and saying, I'm not going to implement this because there's too much fear or I think I'm going to lose my job? Or do you want to be the person who's embracing learning a new technology so that you become invaluable in your organization? And I think that that is just so, so important, right? Because the, the resistance to AI right now is futile. Right, the, the genie is out of the bottle. 
right? No, it's we can't put it back in. The AI train is getting faster and faster and faster. And if people choose, and it is a choice, and I get that there can be fear, and I, I understand all of that, but if people choose not to adopt it, I already know what the outcome is going to be, right? They're just going to be made redundant, literally, because an AI is going to be able to um, be able to do the work that they're doing. Whereas my methodology and how I like to approach things is a human-centric approach to AI, where I like to interview all of the people who are working with the systems and be like, what are the things you don't really enjoy doing? What could I speed up? Would it be good if we did this? Would it be good if we did that? So it's very much keeping the human involved in the process because otherwise you just face massive resistance, right? From people where they're not really um, keen on wanting to change. And you can be an organization, you can put millions into an AI implementation, but if you don't have the buy-in from the people on the ground that they're going to actually leverage the AI, it's just going to be a waste of money. And I think a lot of companies neglect that. They don't realize that we've really got to consider the human, you know, humans are not AI. We have thoughts, we have feelings, we have emotions, and they have to be addressed at a very early stage so that otherwise you can risk like, you know, losing some of your workforce or key employees because they, they're going to get uncomfortable and think that they're not being valued in the organization. Yeah, I think there's a significant leader challenge, leadership challenge coming along with all of this. And as you said, it's got to be the leadership the, at the top level leadership of the organization needs to look at this in a way of not how can we cut costs, not how can we limit our headcount, but how do we free up humans to do the things they say they should be doing instead of the things they get stuck doing. And that's somehow how we sell this to people in a change management fashion is remember all the things you said you should be doing, but you don't get to do because you're busy doing other stuff. That's where AI can help you. And I love your point about someone's going to take your job. It's going to be someone who knows how to use AI. It's not going to be the AI itself. Now, every startup journey has technical hurdles. What's been the biggest challenge your team faced at SuperDupe? And how did you overcome that to push the innovation forward? Yeah, so sometimes um, the biggest challenge is on realistic expectations, right? They people say, oh, but, but that video sort of looks like AI. And I'm like, no, no, it don't look like it. It is, right? It is AI, right? And we are about 95% there with the with the visuals. and But sometimes, um, you know, people say to me, oh, I'm better in person. I'm like, of course you are. You know, like this is not designed to replace you completely, right? It is designed to support you in being able to create more content and be able to circle it. Whereas some people want to try to only use the AI content, which I recommend against, to be honest. I like a hybrid approach because I think I want some of the videos, which is actually you, where you can do a motion and, you know, there's just certain things right, right now AI cannot do. So I think from the super deep perspective, that's been one of our biggest challenges. Um, and it's also being such an early adopter, right? You know, trying to drive this forward. Like I get, you know, I do get negative feedback from people sometimes, you know, how I'm destroying humanity and losing connection and all of this kind of stuff. However, like I said, I'm, I'm not, I don't buy into or subscribe to that feedback because I know that what these people don't realize is if you're not adopting it, your competitor is. Yeah, and I think humanity is doing a pretty good job of uh, cutting back on its connection and possibly destroying itself all on its own. So I don't think Aoife Roche is the only person to blame in all of this. <laughs> so as you've gotten deeper into the tech world, what's the most important lesson you've learned about leadership along the way? And how has leading a cutting edge tech company, you're actually leading two cutting edge tech companies, how has that surprised you? Yeah, so the most important thing for me um, when it comes to from a tech side is transparency, right? From, and from a leadership perspective, I don't care if you deliver me bad news, right? Keep me informed and let me know, but don't hide things, right? Don't hide things from me when things are going wrong or try to. And I think sometimes um, as we're releasing these tech innovations, 
the people can think, oh, you know, look, we don't know what we're, I wouldn't say we don't know what we're doing, but we're building things that haven't existed before, right? So we don't always know what the roadmap is. And even if I had a five-year roadmap, I guarantee by the end of 2025, it would be outdated. So from a leadership perspective, it's promoting a culture of transparency. I don't care if the news that you deliver to me is bad news, but don't hide the bad news from me. If something is not working, or um, it's going to cost more than what we initially to anticipate, or it's not going to work in the way that we initially anticipated. Be upfront and transparent. And sometimes I find, and the other thing, don't oversell something. That drives me absolutely crazy when my technology does this and my technology does that, and I'm a show rather than tell. So when people come to me with their tech solutions, which they do all the time, I'm like, show me. And then, you know, and I asked them to open up the platform and show me. And often some of the stuff that they're taught, it just doesn't work or it hasn't. It has and I'm like, don't oversell your solution because you're only going to make people disappointed and you never get a second chance to get make a first impression. So be transparent within your team around what's actually going on in the team, but also be transparent to your consumer. Like if you have a limitation, tell them you have a limitation. We're not able to do this right now, or this is the best it is right now, because it's evolving so rapidly. If you, even if you have a problem today, in two weeks, you might not have that problem. But trying to hide and disguise this stuff and pretend things do that things that they don't do, that really frustrates me from a leadership perspective, because it wastes everybody's time. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, transparency and not overselling, very important lessons for humans, but also... If you're training an AI right now, if you're using this video to train an AI, make sure that you really highlight this part that Aoife just told us about transparency. Let's get that lesson into the ethics of the AIs we're using as well. So, all right, let's take a break from the serious questions. Let's play a game. Okay. This game is called Rapid Response. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a question and you just respond with the first thing that comes to mind. Don't overthink it. It doesn't need to be a one word answer. You can answer as long as you want, but let's just get the first thing you think of coming out here. Okay. Okay. All right. Aoife Roche, rapid response round. Your time starts now. Podcast recommendation. Alex Hermosi. Good one. Your best tip for writing an AI prompt. Yeah, uh, context. Context, very good. Something besides AI that we should all be paying attention to. Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin, okay. All right, you get a choice here. Don't answer yet. Listen to the whole question. Either your Get Psyched Up song or your walk on music. Mm. Um. Legacy, I think that I have one song which I use for my fitness competitions. It was all about legacy, about creating legacy. I can't remember the name of the track though. All right, well, we'll try to track that down. I was gonna ask you if your answer related to your time doing fitness competitions. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to have you back on sometime to talk about that. Your biggest influence in life? Mm, family. A book everyone should read? Think and Grow Rich. Pumpkin spice, yay or nay, and why? Mm, nay, I'm a black coffee person, simple. Agreed. Next vacation? Philippines. Oh, good one. An important trend to watch? Why Vidal LMs? Agreed. And your favorite sports team? Well, you know what? I don't even, I haven't even watched any sports in America because I've been doing so much work. I need to, I need to get involved. Well, we're going to have to go to a Golden Knights game or something when we uh, get a chance or a Raiders game or a UNLV game or something since we're both here in Las Vegas. That would be amazing because I haven't done, I, you know what? I haven't ever been to a sporting event in America. True story. All right. Well, we're going to have to put that on the list of things to do when we can find some time. All right. Well, thank you for playing our game. It's always always exciting to learn a little bit more about our guests than we might get from the, the tech and leadership questions. So now, as a leader, someone who uh, leadership is important to, I'm dying to know, how do you prepare your team 
to thrive alongside artificial intelligence. What's the secret to balancing tech innovation and human leadership? So um, what I say to my team all the time um, is how can you not do this? I want you to focus on how you can not do this. So um, like, for example, perfect example this morning, we had someone say, I need to read through the RFP so that I can get a checklist. Right. And then one of my team members actually agreed to that. So I came on and I said, why did we agree to that? No, put it into the AI and get the AI to draft the checklist, which it did. And then we send that back over. So at every layer and level, I asked them, like, is it can an AI do this? Like, or, or can we at a minimum train an AI to be able to do this? Um, and then, because, and what the other thing that I do is I also reduce the lead times that I give people to actually have stuff done. So that kind of amplifies the pressure on them a little bit that they have to leverage AI in the process because there's no way that they could do the timelines that I'm pushing towards without leveraging AI in the process. So, you know, it's getting them to realize how much of a benefit AIs are to them um, and how much they can leverage it. And then we create an assistant for pretty much every single task you could imagine in my business has, has an assistant. I love it. I love the idea of raising the stakes on people oh, to, sure. uh, to get them to achieve more. We used to do that with young officers in the Air Force all the time. We, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't put them in a situation they couldn't handle, but we would raise the stakes on them to try to really see what they would do to excel. So what's the one thing about leadership now that you're in the tech world that you didn't expect to discover? Um, so knowledge um, and capital are not the same thing. So what I've realized, and it was actually is a, a big investor that said it to me, I always assumed just because people had the money that they had the knowledge. And then he was like, no, we don't understand anything about this industry. We understand, you know, at a, super, a surface level, but you cannot underestimate how much you can, you actually know when you're within your industry or niche compared to the people who might be actually funding your actual venture. And sometimes because we can feel a bit inferior, right? Just because someone is wealthier than us or has more money than us, we can assume that they know more than us. But the reality is, in most times, they've made their money within their particular niche and industry. And when it could, and that might never have been in tech. They might have made it somewhere completely different. So I've definitely learned that, not to assume that they know. And then the second thing is actually be very careful about your language and your information. Because um, it's very easy for us. I talk tech all day. I talk AI all day. But you have to learn how to dumb your language down when you're going out and talking to you know, to other like potential VCs and investors. And because you, you risk, if you don't do that, that you make them feel like uh, that they don't understand what's going on in a confused mind, doesn't buy, doesn't invest, doesn't do anything. So you've got to really realize, go and meet people where they're at and understand like most people may not even really know how to use chat GPT effectively. So the idea that they can integrate these large tech solutions for us, it might be just like climbing a small mountain, but for them, it's Mount Everest. And I think you just need to have that awareness that you just because we do AI every day doesn't mean that everybody else does. And especially the people with lots of capital, right? A lot of them are not tech entrepreneurs. They're just very successful VCs in different areas. So understand that you're not going to always impress them by using complicated language to try to describe what you do. If anything, it actually can be off-putting. I think you have just dropped the two most important pieces of knowledge that every tech founder who's looking to raise money right now needs to hear. So that that's a, I think we definitely have one of the big clips from the episode there. So as we talked about earlier, our Vegas tech community is small, but growing fast. What's the one move Las Vegas, Southern Nevada needs to make to become a true hub for tech entrepreneurs like you and your teams? Yeah, so I, I definitely, and I know there is work going on with these like centers of excellence and innovations, right? I think because if you put a bunch of smart people in a room together on a regular basis, good things happen, right? Great things are created. So creating that infrastructure 
where you have innovation centers or hub centers where people can kind of go, maybe hang out, like brainstorm ideas, um, find other vendors or partners. Because it's some stuff, for example, like when we're pitching for the government, there's like, there's billboards, there's geofencing with media buying, there's TV, there's a whole bunch of stuff that even if I win that contract, I don't want to do that part of the contract. I'll be looking out for subcontractors and different things like that. So I think having those sort of innovation hubs and centers where they would spotlight different entrepreneurs, putting that out to their network and audience would be a very good way that we could kind of really discover what everybody's doing, where their strengths are, and then how how we can leverage each other. Like, because, you know, one plus one when it comes to entrepreneurs is not equal to two. Right. If you put a group of highly successful, smart entrepreneurs together, they'll either create businesses, products, services, or they're going to help. Um, so really creating the, those sort of um, that innovation center, I think, where and doing more events very much focused on the tech entrepreneur space. There's no question this has been a momentous year for you and your companies. What's the next big milestone you're driving towards and how are you motivating your team to achieve it? So my, I'm trying to downsize. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to offboard things. I, I love creating things, right? Um, but I, I'm guilty the same as many other entrepreneurs, right, of polyphasic thinking. I can do a lot of things at the same time. But as I'm maturing and learning in my entrepreneurial journey, I'm realizing you're actually better to have a singular focus um, a singular line of focus. So I really am excited about what we're doing in the government contracting space. I see that as a huge opportunity for not only um, for our more high level vendor management clients, but just for normal, um, regular business owners who want to build that relationship with the government, but just don't know how. Um, and that's what I plan to just double down on. With the agency, we'll keep running because it kind of runs on repeat. My teams are running that, but I guess when I'm really talking to my team about what we're doing, it's really about how, how can we really cut the fat to just, I just want us to only focus on the 20% that is the revenue generating activities. And I want us to get rid of all of the other noise. Um, because I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes we go really wide, right? We're trying to figure out what works and um, which is fine because you got to do that in the beginning. But as you figure out what's working, it's time to try, trying to downsize. So I will probably sell one of my company, but I'll probably sell it into one of my other businesses. Like I'll just, um, what are something that I'm working on? I just don't want to be running all of these companies. And that, I suppose that's one thing that I would say to people. Don't be afraid to turn around if you start an entrepreneur journey and go, actually, I would rather be an entrepreneur. There is nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur as well as an entrepreneur. I think people can hold up being an entrepreneur like a badge of honor, right? But I, without actually really understanding how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur, how difficult it is every single month to be responsible for payroll and tax and insurance and all of the other things that, that come along with being an entrepreneur. And that you could take and be just as successful in an entrepreneur role with a heavy commissions and not have half the stress, right? So that is kind of, I think for me, it's consolidate my businesses and then focus, like I said, with taking the VP of sales role um, is how can I actually focus on being an entrepreneur as well as an entrepreneur? Because there's no badge of honor to, to be trying to do all of this stuff by yourself. You grow when you have access to capital, access to people and access to the resources that you need to actually grow and scale. There's definitely a lot more to entrepreneurship than just uh, than just building cool stuff and having ideas. So that's a, that's important to point out. And as you're trying to offload things, as you're trying to get a little narrower and not think so wide, what's the key quality you're looking for in team members as you're bringing them on to help you do that? Yeah. So um, my and I'm very blessed um, with my team. Um, like and we have gone through like a lot of different people. My core value is speed of implementation, right? That is the core value of a bit. It's one of my core values. Um, so I always seek out people who are very driven um, and very driven. And I have no problem with giving equity or, um, you know, like making sure they're very highly paid, having good bonus structures, 
all of these things in place for people so that I can attract that top tier talent. So when I'm looking out for team members, you have to be driven. You have, if you're someone who says, I'm just working a nine to five, um, you know, and I'll take my lunch break from this and I'll take my 15 minute breaks. You're, ju- you're not going to fit in this organization. You're really not because we're working at such an accelerated pace. However, if you were someone who's a go-getter um, and very uh, interested in moving forward at an accelerated pace, then like I like when my team proved me wrong. I love it. When, even with my media buying team, I'm like, please beat my ads. I want you to beat them, beat the perform. I'm not territorial of it. I love it. And I think it's important then to find those people and a little bit of competitiveness um, in amongst them is always good. But if it's not, if it's not someone who doesn't have a core value of speed of implementation or a quick decision maker, it's probably not going to fit in my culture. Speaking of proving us wrong, we've all made mistakes as entrepreneurs. What's the best mistake you've ever made and how did it end up being a game changer for you and your companies? The best mistake I've ever made. That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, God, there's like so many. Oh, I actually do have a good one. So um, price, not having my prices high enough. So because I'm trying to sort of move out of the agency um, space, I increased one of my products 5x and I increased the other one by 20%. And, they, I, and then I went out and I thought, okay, you know, I'll go and do this event and no one's going to buy it. And then everyone bought it. <laughs> And I was like, okay, so it should have always been that price. Yeah, like, it sounds to me like they might might even need to be a little higher. Exactly, right? But I think as entrepreneurs, right, especially in the beginning, we, we tend to devalue sometimes what we're doing. Um, but with confidence comes competence. So the, the probably the, the biggest mistake that I made was having my prices too low. But the learning from that was me realizing that they will pay whatever I ask, right? As long as that I can demonstrate the value of what I'm showcasing and doing. So that was definitely um, a very good learning for me. And then I realized, you know, I did 50K in one product and then I five, I, I could have done a quarter of a million had I backed myself a little bit more and actually um, done that. So that was a good learning, but you know, it won't happen again. <laughs> so. <laughs> We got to, you know, that, that's what we learned from our mistakes, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly a lesson I've had to learn as an entrepreneur, and I'm still kind of working through that and, and finding my level of success with that. So artificial intelligence is a fast-paced industry. When adversity hits, how do you stay calm and centered? What's your secret for leading your team with resilience? Yeah, so I, I think especially in the AI space, because things go wrong all the time, right? Something could be working one day and then it's broken the next day as you're building out and developing. So the practice of patience, right? Even though I like I have to work on it sometimes because I do get frustrated. Um, but the practice of patience and just know that when you're building out things that don't exist or you're building out new things that you're inevitably going to hit into problems. You absolutely are inevitably going to hit into problems. And then I try to say, say that with my, like I said at the beginning with my team, if it's not working, have that transparency, right, in, in every layer and level of the process. If something isn't working, don't hide from me that it's not working. It's the worst thing that you can do um, because I'll trip over it somewhere else. Just be transparent and understand that you need patience, um, especially when you're building out these technologies. And you need vision, you need vision because uh, sometimes people say, well, you can't do that, Ethan. And I'm like, why not? I question the narrative. Why can't I do that? You know, unless you can give me a very valid justification, if I can see it, then I can believe it. Right. So I think that that's the other thing is be transparent. Don't let people dilute your vision. But also, do you have to learn to be patient, which is a bit of a that's a bit of a delicate balance, to be honest. What's keeping you up at night right now? What are the big challenges your team is facing and how are you handling them? Yeah, <laughs> me doing an Apple style launch at the conference. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, on a pro, because right now what I'm building for the government stuff um, doesn't exist in the way that I built it before. So, they like trying to figure out that, like, I spent, was it last Friday? I spent eight hours working on a single prompt. So, um, yeah, and then that, that constant iteration and iteration and iteration, and then trying to, 
get other people to subscribe in or buy into the ideas, right? Which is really, really important. Um, so I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but it definitely gets me up in the morning because I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta figure this out. I, I want to highlight something you said there. I want to make sure the, the viewers and listeners don't miss that. You spent eight hours working on a single prompt last Friday. That That is the kind of specificity and attention to detail that we need to work with AI right now. Is It will probably get better. AIs will get smarter. They'll be able to intuit more. But but if something's important, it's really important, whether whether it's eight minutes or eight hours, if you're working with AI, take the time and care to really, to really think through your prompts so that you can get the output you're looking for. Yeah, and the length of like you know, that like if you do a two-line prompt, do you expect a two-line answer, right? You know what I mean? It's like or a generic answer. The more specific you get at what you're asking. Um, from the AI system, the more context that you can give it and who it is, what it does, how you want it to execute, all of those kind of things, um, the better the result is going to be. Um, so I think that sometimes people, oh, I'm just going to type a prompt in chat GPT. I'm like, it's not, it's not as to really get solid output. Like my prompts could be like this long, you know what I mean, with multiple iterations, but I know the more information that I give the AI, the more context it has, the more likely it is to give me back the right answer. Clear communication and transparency. It's good for leading humans. It's good for working with AI. What's the one thing you're most excited about for your companies coming up in the near future? What innovation is going to change the game for you? Yeah, so I think what we want to do, the, the autonomous agents with um, the Ask AI platform is definitely one that I'm kind of excited about, which where that they will sequentially execute the tasks. The idea is that we can create agents and assistants who, who reason and have thought processes just like us is another one that I'm excited about. Um, the idea of having digital employees, right, is another one. The idea that you know my team could could ask me, or they could go and ask Efa AI, and it would be taught and trained to reason exactly like Efa. And that's why I I encourage people when you're actually doing your work on a daily basis, like within a lot of these AI systems, and I ask or why you can actually use voice, right? You can actually talk to it. So you know, don't be afraid to start sharing your thought processes of how and why you do things. Um, with an AI assistant so that it can gather that data because eventually that data is going to become incredibly useful to you as you start building out um, AI assistants that are going to be able to mimic your behavior so that you can actually, because like, I'll be honest, I, do I want to sit in front of this laptop all day? I'd much rather be over in the Philippines doing what I want to do. You know <laughs> what I mean? But right now we haven't trained IFA AI yet, so she's not there, but eventually... The idea, um, and then the oh, I also the other one that I really like the idea of is creating the virtual employees so that we would have a virtual or, or a digital whatever you want to call it CEO CMO and that one AI would write something it would send it to the CMO the CMO would review it then it would go back to the CFO the CFO would review it and people think like I just saw one from OpenAI I think it's called Swarm S W A R M they just released it today and that's what they're moving towards. This idea of that there will be conversations going back and forth between the different AIs as they start to reason, which is pretty wild. Well, I love it because more time at the gym, more time by the pool, more time on the golf course for me if all these AIs are doing the work. Exactly. We work too hard to work this hard. That's right. So for all the future leaders watching, what's your best piece of advice for someone who's looking to build and scale a tech company, especially in the artificial intelligence space? Yeah. Pick one use case. Pick one single use case and go after that one. Similar like what I'm doing. I could do a million and one different use cases, but I'm very specifically going after government contracting. Pick one use case, get it down until you do your first six figures, and then move on to your next use case. And that can be similar for a client avatar or business vertical. Pick one vertical. Don't Because when you market to everyone, you market to nobody. 
right? Pick the person that you want to help, find the problem that you want to solve and double down on it until you've solved that problem and someone has paid you six figures for it. And at that point, when you finally got that six figures, then move on to your next problem. Because too many people go too many problems, too many verticals, too many areas. And I've done it. I've wasted so much time um, in doing that. But I think it's a rite of passage that every entrepreneur has to go through that we try a bunch of different things and then we see what sticks. I think we all do it. I, I've done it and I've never known an entrepreneur who hasn't done it. Yeah. Aoife, it's always a pleasure talking with you. It's always educational and enlightening. Tell everyone watching and listening where they can find you. Yeah, so you can, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can go to Aoife, A-O-I-F-E, Roach, O-C-H-E dot com. Um, that's my personal website. Or um, And then if you want to reach out to the company website, the easiest way to get to me is via the Attention Grabbers website. So it's attentiongrabbersusa.com. You can just submit a form there and it will get you on to book into an appointment with either me or my team. Sounds fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for tuning in. If you liked what Eva had to say today, please reach out and thank her for joining us. Also, check out some of our other videos and please like, comment, share, and subscribe. It helps us out so much to get out to see the people who we want to see us. Also, if you're listening on a platform where you can leave us a review, please leave us a five-star review. We love sharing these conversations with you. Keep watching. Keep developing your leader's mindset. Onward and upward.